It's great to see everybody here this morning and uh, pray that your heart has already been richly blessed. I could, uh, I'm so excited I may just preach an hour or two. So my wife tells me all the time I can preach as long as I want to, but everybody's going to get up and go home at some point. So yeah. if you have God's word with you today, if you would turn with me to John chapter 19, as we continue this series, Jesus words from the cross. Today we will see a word of affection from the lips of Jesus. John chapter 19. John is being crucified. The preceding passage right next to the one that we're getting ready to read, the, the uh, Roman soldiers are dividing his garments. And... Uh, Mockery still continues. Christ's suffering still continues. And yet in the midst of all the suffering, we hear these words, beginning in verse 25. But standing by the cross of Jesus were his mother and his mother's sister, Mary the wife of Clopas and Mary Magdalene. When Jesus saw his mother... And the disciple whom he loved standing nearby, he said to his mother, Woman, behold your son. Then he said to the disciple, Behold your mother. And from that hour the disciple took her into his own home. Let's go to God in prayer. Father, how gracious you have been to us. Lord, we have experienced your amazing grace. Father, your grace has brought us thus far, and it's your grace that will continue to lead us day after day. Lord, as we come today to hear the words of Christ as he hangs on the cross, Lord, what tender words he speaks. And Father, I pray as we come to this hour that you would speak through this your servant, that you would honor your people that you would exalt your Son, the Lord Jesus Christ, in this place. And Father, people would be drawn to Him, and the amazing love that He has for others. Father, we pray all of this, and we ask it in Jesus' precious name. Amen. As we come to this third phrase that Jesus speaks when He's hanging on the cross, we see Jesus continuing to focus not on Himself, but on others. We see in this passage Jesus being concerned about his mother. The Bible tells us that one of the Ten Commandments tells us to honor our father and our mother. Jesus was well aware of that particular commandment because on one occasion the religious leaders came to Jesus and they complained because the disciples didn't wash their hands before they had supper. Now, you know, I don't know about you guys. I, I like to wash my hands before I eat, but, you know, I have eaten with dirty hands before. You're out working somewhere and somebody offers you some food and you just eat. And uh, that's exactly what the disciples were doing. And the, the religious leaders, the religious establishment that was always trying to find a way to trap Jesus, of course, of course pointed out to him that his disciples weren't doing the right thing. This was Jesus' response to them. He said, You leave the commandment of God and hold to the tradition of men. And He said to them, You have a fine way of rejecting the commandment of God in order to establish your tradition. For Moses said, Honor your father and mother, and whoever reviles his father and mother must surely die. So Jesus understood what they were doing. And He said, You should rather obey God than... Man, Jesus saw taking care of his mother as a great responsibility. And even as he's hanging on the cross with a cosmic battle going on between light and darkness, the battle of having to carry the weight of the sins of the world upon your shoulder, he still has time to fulfill his human responsibilities. So what can we learn from this passage that will help us be better sons and daughters and better able to honor 
God. Notice first of all, this passage tells us something really important that Jesus saw his mother. Now the word that's used in that text is not the normal word that when you just look and see something. The particular word that's used here is look with, with knowing, or in other words, looking with intent, or looking with perspective. What that tells me is that Jesus realistically saw where his mother was, what situation she was in. You have this tender scene. Four women and one man edged their way up to, the, to Mount Calvary Slope, and they're standing beneath the cross of Jesus. You have Mary, the mother of Jesus, Mary, the wife of Clopas. You have Jesus' aunt, Salome, who was John's mother. And you have Mary Magdalene, the one who had seven demons in her that Jesus cast out, that Jesus radically transformed her life. And then you have John. John was a very special person for Jesus. We'll talk about that in a minute. But the passage indicates for us that Jesus saw his mother. Now, can you just for a minute, I know it's hard for us to imagine at this point in history, but can you imagine a mother standing at the foot of the cross knowing her son has never done anything wrong, knowing her son has never committed sin. Can you imagine how Mary's heart must have been breaking at that moment in time? She had rejoiced when she was chosen to bear the Messiah, even though she was probably a young lady, maybe somewhere between 14 and 16 years old. She rejoiced when she was chosen by God to bear the Messiah. When Jesus was born, she was probably by that time being ostracized by her family and friends and community that she was in because she was a single lady who was pregnant. Although she really wasn't single by their, their law, but in their eyes they were supposed to not have had any kind of marital relations between her and Joseph. And so she would have been observed or watched as a single lady. Here you have a lady that's pregnant. And her only excuse is, I've never known a man. Can you imagine as a 14 to 16 year old little girl trying to explain that to somebody? And then when Jesus is born, she's far away from home. She's in a barn. She takes Jesus and lays him in a feeding trough because that's the only place they had to put the child. A few days later, Joseph has this dream by the Holy Spirit that Jesus' life is in danger. And so he whisked Jesus off to Egypt now you have a 14 or 16 year old daughter that's been moved from Galilee to Bethlehem where Jesus is born. Now they're all the way down in Egypt. She's moving further and further away from her family. It's just her and Joseph. That's it. Now imagine yourself, a 14 or 16 year old girl who's just gotten married. That's as far away from home. You, you can't go to mom when you don't, you know, when you burn the beans. There's no, there's no internet. There's no FaceTime. You know, you can't get the recipe from mom. You, you just have to make do the best you can. And make do, that's exactly what she did. To protect the baby Jesus, they left and went to Egypt. Like most mothers, if you observe Mary, she would have done anything and everything to protect her son from going through what he was experiencing. And yet there was absolutely nothing that she can do. She sees her son beaten, bruised, battered, skin is literally flayed off of his back, he's stuck on a cruel cross, and there's absolutely nothing she can do about it. I, I wonder if she thought to herself and remembered the words of Simon. If you remember the words of Simon when Jesus was born, when he was presented in the temple after eight days, Simon had been told by the Holy Spirit that he would not see death until he saw the Lord's Messiah come to the temple. And so he was there day and night. Every day he was at the temple waiting to see the Messiah. And when Jesus comes along, he, he holds Jesus in his arms and he realizes this is the, the Messiah. And so he says, Lord, I can depart in peace now because I have seen the Lord's Messiah. But then he turns to Mary and he says, a sword will pierce your own soul also. 
I wonder if Mary thought about those words as she's standing at the foot of her son. His wounds bled. She couldn't touch him. He thirsted. She couldn't give him anything to drink. The crown of thorns that had been shoved down on his head was causing blood to trickle in his eyes. And of course, his, hunk, his hands are hung out by his side so he can't wipe it out of his eyes. Don't you know she longed just to reach up there and to wipe that blood and sweat off of her son's face? If you can even begin, mothers, to relate to that. Now I want you to think, now that you've got that picture in your mind, now think how Jesus must have felt as He's hanging on that cross, watching His mother suffer. I had this image in my mind that those ladies that were with Mary were literally propping her up to keep her from collapsing under the, the weight of her hurt and her suffering. It must have broken Jesus' heart to watch His mother going through the suffering that she was experiencing. The second thing this passage tells us about Jesus is that Jesus honored His mother. He spoke to her and called her woman. Now for us, that's a, almost a slight. You better not call anybody woman because they're liable to slap you if you're talking to your wife. But it was a term of endearment and it was a term of honor and it was a term of respect. Jesus was never disrespectful to His mother. He followed the injunction found in Exodus 20 to honor your father and mother. The Gospels record to us three different times that Jesus addressed His mother and He always dressed her with the utmost respect that she rightly deserves. One of them is probably pretty familiar to you. It's when Jesus was a young boy and the Bible tells us that uh, the family had gone to celebrate one of the feasts and the family had left assuming Jesus was with some of his cousins. I mean, they usually went as a large entourage from Galilee down to Jerusalem and they assumed that Jesus was with some of the other families, probably 11 or 12 years old at this point. Well, after they found camp the first night and couldn't find him, they go back to Jerusalem and start looking for him and they finally find him. And Mary turns to Jesus and says, you know, how can you do this? How could you have treated us this way? And Jesus responded, why were you looking for me? Did you not know that I must be in my father's house? And then the Bible tells us that Jesus went down with them, with his mother and his father, and came to Nazareth and was submissive to them. And his mother treasured up these things in her heart and Jesus increased in wisdom and in stature and in favor with God and with man. So Jesus honored His parents. I, I know a lot of parents today that would just about have a heart attack if their, if their children honored them like they ought to be honored. It ought not be that way, but I'm just telling you the reality in which we find ourselves and the world in which we live today. On another occasion, Jesus also addressed His mother as woman. It was when His ministry had first begun, and His mother in some way was in charge of a, a wedding feast, and they ran out of wine, and she approached Jesus and asked for His help. And He said, Woman, my time has not yet come. But she turned to the servants and said, Just do whatever He tells you to do. She didn't know how Jesus was going to solve the problem. She didn't really, I don't know that she even expected Jesus to perform a miracle. Maybe he just, she just expected Jesus to go find some wine somewhere and bring it. I don't know what her expectations were, but she had enough trust in her son. And his, her son had enough honor and respect for her that he met her need at that point in time. The Bible reminds us time and time again we ought to honor our fathers and mothers. Can I ask a simple question that I'm sure many of y'all have asked before? Why do we ignore this simple command from God? Why is it young people go through that stage where they're fortunate that they live past that stage? Maybe I should say that. I tell people all the time, you know, if you won't kill your grand, if you won't kill your kids, maybe you'll get grandkids, and that's worth, so, that's so worth not killing your kids over. So, but why is it we dishonor the Lord? Why is it we don't live in honor 
to our parents. We're getting ready to start studying 1 Peter on Sunday nights, and I hope and pray you can be with us. We're going to have a great time. I'm not going to tell you how long it's going to take, because I don't know how long it's going to take. It's going to take however long it takes to get through it. We're going to have a good time. We're going to study God's Word. But Peter says in there, Be subject to the Lord's sake to every human institution. I believe parenthood is a human institution, is it not? It's also a God-ordained institution. And we'll see more about that as we study 1 Peter. But we are to be subject to human institutions, not for our sake and not for their sake, but for the Lord's sake. We are supposed to honor our parents for the Lord's sake. Not for what it does or doesn't do for us. Not what it does or doesn't do for them. We are to honor them for the Lord's sake. Jesus honored His mother. Lastly, notice that Jesus also cared for His mother. A primary responsibility of honoring a father and mother, according to the Old Testament, you just have to go read it, is that you are to take care of your parents in their old age. Now, Mary was not old at this point in time. She was probably pretty old for there. She was about probably in her 40s by this point in time, which lifespans were not near as long back then as they are now. But Jesus, as a widow in that society, always looked to her eldest son to take care of her needs. If the husband has passed away, and most the absence of any word about Joseph after that time that Jesus was about 12 years old, the, the scriptures never mention Joseph again. Most people feel like Joseph has died. Jesus is the one responsible. Mary was with Jesus pretty much everywhere he went. She saw, he saw to her needs because that's what he was supposed to do. Uh, with her heart breaking, I doubt Mary was even thinking about this when she was standing at the foot of her son, Jesus Christ. But Jesus was. Jesus was concerned about his mother. Now ordinarily, the siblings, Jesus' other siblings, would have taken care of her mother, their mother, uh, once Jesus was dead. But you remember from what John 7 tells us, Jesus' brothers and sisters were not, at this point in time, they weren't believers. And for Jesus, the spiritual relationship was a lot more valuable than blood ties, if you will. In fact, one time Jesus' family stood outside the doors looking to talk and speak to Jesus. And Jesus, when that, somebody approached Jesus about it, He says, For whoever does the will of my Father in heaven is my brother and my sister and my, no, and my mother. Jesus came to establish a new kingdom. It was to be a spiritual kingdom. And relationships were more important based on spiritual ties than they were on physical ties. And so Jesus, understanding where his mother was, seeing her as, with a point of understanding of knowing she was going to be all alone and all by herself, turned to his beloved friend, John. And he speaks to his mother, and he says, Woman, behold your son. And then he speaks to John and says, Behold your mother. Notice the scripture here refers to Jesus as, or in this book, in the book of John, it refers to John as the disciple that Jesus loved. Now, do you think Jesus would have entrusted his mother to anybody that he didn't love? Anybody that didn't love him? Jesus saw John. John was the only one who had the courage to come back to the cross and stand. You remember the disciples when Jesus were arrested, they were afraid they were all going to be put to death. And so they all fled and left Jesus all by himself. It was John who brought Jesus' mother and the other ladies up to the foot of the cross so that they could see what was taking place. If somebody has written, noted that if he who knows all things had not known that John loved him, he would not have made John his mother's guardian. John, of course, received a great honor, didn't he? To be asked of his dear friend, Jesus, but not only his dear friend, his Lord and his Savior. Here's what I know. People who love the Lord Jesus Christ don't have any problem doing anything for Him. They'll do whatever the Lord asks them to do. That's exactly what you see John doing.
Folks, we've been given a God-given commandment to honor our father and our mother. If you love the Lord Jesus Christ, you don't have any problem with that. You simply do what the Lord has asked you to do. Remember the words of Paul. If any widow has children or grandchildren, and let them first learn to show piety at home and to repay their parents. For this is good and acceptable before God. But if anyone does not provide for his own, and especially for those of his household, he is denied the faith and is worse than an unbeliever. As we think about Jesus Christ, does it not move us? When you and I are suffering, where's our focus? It's typically on us, isn't it? We're trying to get out of it ourselves, or we're begging God to get us out of it, or... But the focus is never on it, what everybody, on everybody else, it's on us. But here you see the Son of God dying for the sins of the world who is concerned about those around Him, especially His mother. The Bible makes it clear that we're to honor our father and mother. The simple question that I have for you this morning is, do you honor your father and mother? The Bible never says, it never puts any qualifications on that. It never says if, if they don't treat you like you think you deserve to be treated or they don't do what you want them to do. They don't give you everything you want. If you're young or you're old, it doesn't make any qualifications. It simply says you are to honor your father and mother. And it's also the only commandment with a promise. Did you know that? It says, honor your father and mother so that you may live long in the land the Lord your God is giving you. You want to live a long and full life? Well, one of the things you can do is to honor your father and your mother. Let's go to the Lord in prayer. Father, as we come to the sacred time of invitation, Lord, I know that, Lord, your Holy Spirit is dealing with hearts today. Lord, it's been a great day. We've seen people, uh, Lord, follow you in obedience doing what you've asked and commanded them to do. And Father, even that example today provides an example for us to follow. Lord, I don't know what you need to do in each heart and mind here. But Father, I pray that every one of us would open our lives up to you today. And that Father, your Holy Spirit would be very specific in what we need to do this morning. Father, I pray that and I ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. Let me just speak to Christians first. Just what, what are you doing as a Christian to see to the needs of your family? You know, I've observed some Christians that haven't honored their parents. I've seen some that have put their parents in a nursing home because they don't like the way it smells or they don't like to be reminded of the fact one of these days they may wind up in a place like that. They never go see their parents. Sad, isn't it? What are you doing to meet the needs of your parents? Let me ask you another question. This is something else we don't usually think about, but you know God has placed you both in a physical family as well as a spiritual family. How many widows do we have in our church? We're not going to count, but I can tell you we've got a lot. How many of them no longer have living children or how many of them have children who are so far away they really don't ever see them? Nobody ever comes by to visit with them. What are you doing to honor them? What are you doing to meet the needs that they might have? I challenge you this morning, if you're a believer in Christ, you're a member of Rock Hill Baptist Church, find a way to minister to others around you. People here are hurting. Some of our widow ladies that need some help around the house. Go fix their lawnmower or go vacuum their house or... Go paint their house. I don't know whatever God convicts you to do and whatever needs to be done. My thing is just go spend time with them. Many of them are lonely and they need somebody just to talk to. Let me say this. If you have a parent who abused you, 
I know these words are hard to hear. It's hard to honor somebody physically that has verbally or emotionally or physically abused you. Let me just say this. The same Lord Jesus that had compassion on His mother has compassion on you. He has compassion on your soul. Go to Him and let Him meet your needs. Let Him take away the hurt and the pain that you've experienced. And then ask God how you can best honor your parents. It may be simply you honor them by telling them the truth. Sometimes that's exactly what they need to hear. I don't really know what God has for you to do. It's different for every person. That's why you've got to get along with the Lord and spend time with Him. And if you're here today and you don't know Christ, is there any doubt that Christ loves you? The Bible says that God so loved the world that He gave His only begotten Son. And that same compassion and concern that Jesus had for His mother is the same compassion and concern that Jesus has for you. The Bible tells us that God does not want any to perish, but for all to have everlasting life. And for a person who puts their faith and trust in the Lord Jesus Christ, they can have their sins forgiven. Maybe you think some reason or another, you just think for whatever reason, maybe I'm so sinful, I'm so bad that God can't love somebody like me. Well, if God can love somebody like me, God can love somebody like you. I can promise you that. Why don't you accept that love? You know, salvation is a gift. It's not something we get to earn or pay for. Jesus paid it all so that we don't have to pay anything. But we must turn to Him in repentance and faith if we want to be saved. That's the gift that God offers to you today. I don't know what God wants to do in your life at this invitation time, but you do what the Lord impresses on your heart. Let's stand together and sing. Adam.